Okay, we'll call to order the City Commission for March 7th, 2016. Um, first thing on our, what we will do is have invocation. Uh, Pastor Andrew Kennard from the First United Methodist Church, will you lead us in invocation? Let's pray. Loving God, we ask your blessings on all those gathered here today as we come together in friendship and fellowship and to do the work of the city. We thank you for the blessings of our individual and collective God-given gifts. Place in our hearts the desire to make a difference to our families, to our community, to our country, and to all people around the world. Give us balance in times of distraction and uncertainty. Help us move towards our goals with determination and always with an abundant sense of humor. God, we ask your blessings on this gathering here tonight, those who serve and those who have worked hard to make progress towards today and continue into the future. For all of this, we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, we have the third grade class from Mrs. Mrs. Carter's third grade class from Lincoln Elementary to lead us in Pledge of Allegiance. You wanna pile up and do that? Mine, Mine too. My name is Hunter Ham, and my favorite thing about Eduardo is BG Stadium. My name is Abram Pena, and my favorite thing about Eduardo is BG Stadium. I'm Lauren Zerfus and my favorite thing to do in El Dorado is dance. My name is Tanner Riddle. My favorite thing about El Dorado is BG Stadium. My name is Chloe Van Poole, and my favorite thing about El Dorado is the water park. My name is James Van Fossen, and my favorite thing about El Dorado is the BG Stadium. <laughs> My name is Maddox Moreno, and my favorite thing about El Dorado is the bowling alley. My, my name is Keegan Parks. My favorite thing about El Dorado is the city pool. All right, thank you. Can you lead us in the flag swimming? Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Thank you, Mrs. Carter's third grade class. <coughs> Next on our agenda is a proclamation. Um, read this, the proclamation for a severe weather week that's upcoming. Um, I'll read this aloud. Uh, proclamation, whereas severe weather and tornado season in Kansas has always been known as a potentially dangerous time and Whereas Butler County, Kansas has experienced over 70 reported tornadoes since 1950, resulting in almost 30 deaths and more than 250 injuries, and whereas everyone is potentially at risk during thunderstorms and the tornado season, which can last from March through November, and whereas the National Weather Service, in conjunction with the state of Kansas and Butler County, will be conducting a severe weather drill and local tornado sirens NOAA weather radio alarms and emergency alert systems on Tuesday, March 15th at 6.30 p.m. And whereas the purpose of the Severe Weather Awareness Week is to heighten the public's awareness to the dangers that severe weather and tornadoes can possess. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Vince Haynes, Mayor of the City of El Dorado, do hereby proclaim March 14th through the 18th 2016 as Severe Weather Awareness Week in the city of El Dorado, and I urge all citizens to support efforts to recognize the need to increase awareness of the potential dangers of severe weather. And in witness thereof, I hereto set my hand and cause the official seal of the El Dorado of Kansas to be affixed this seventh day of March, 2016. Tabitha, do you have the official proclamation? Um, that's not in your pile. Uh, I've got a seal to it, but I can certainly sign this one. You like this one? No, I'll get you one in a little bit. Okay, let's it do that. Let's do one that's not got three-hole punch binders. <laughs> yeah. 
perfect. <coughs> um, and I, yeah, and I guess I would uh, would say, yeah, uh, severe weather awareness week to, to, to let everybody know that uh, 630 of an evening is not our normal time to test the siren, so be aware. And um, Herb, is there, is there, we used to at one time have a two, two different siren calls, one, one that was intermittent and one that was solid. Is there a difference now at all that the, that the citizens should be aware of? They used to have a wavering tone, Mayor. Um, now they have one single tone. It may still sound like a wavering tone, a two-stage uh, siren, but it's because generally all of our sirens, you know, all of our sirens spin fully around. So you may hear it really loud when you're mm -hmm. facing it. When it's facing away from you, it may sound like it goes down a little bit, but they used to be wavering tones. That's correct. Now the, the refinery still uses a wavering tone okay. and that's how it's pretty easy to determine their sirens going off for Mars. So, okay. but they do have a wavering tone and I believe theirs goes off for lightning and severe weather as well. So. Didn't the wavering tone though used to mean- here Was the civil, de was the civil yeah. defense tone. Yeah, yeah. But they, okay. they don't use that anymore. So. All right, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Next on our agenda is personal appearances. Anybody wishing to address the commission with personal appearance? Mayor, these are actually scheduled. Personal appearances are scheduled. Oh, that's right. I was thinking about. Right, public comment. Yeah, public and comment. so you have two here tonight. Susie from um, SCARP. And uh, Emily, that I haven't seen. Junior. There you are. And Emily from uh, Main Street. Okay. Yeah, my mistake. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Susie, thank you. Hi, I am Susie Thien from. Uh, I'm the executive director of Sunlight Children's Advocacy and Rights Foundation, or SCARF. And I will tell you, it's nice to come here and see some familiar faces. This is great. We've been, uh, been around here for a long time. And I will just speak briefly because those of you who know me know I can go on and on about SCARF, and I know our time is limited. So first I want to thank you for providing me the opportunity to do this. We, uh, in the past, have not had the opportunity to uh, in person Thank you for all of uh, your support. SCARF was incorporated in 2004, and we opened our first program in 2007, uh, actually March of 2007. And that is Sunlight Child Advocacy Center, which is here in El Dorado, and that is over on Gordy Street. And if you have not been over there, please come over for a tour. It'll take you about five minutes. Um, we're small but mighty, uh, and just basically what we do there is it is a place for alleged victims of child abuse to come to be interviewed, and the only referrals that we can take are through law enforcement and our social, our social workers, uh, Department <coughs> for Children and Services, DCF social workers. The child comes there. It's a very child-friendly environment. We have 10 standards we have to uh, follow and um, they are interviewed by someone who has been forensically trained. They, they are a certified interviewer. Uh, we follow the case from start to finish. Uh, it is a team approach. While the child is being interviewed in an adjacent <coughs> room, our whole team is watching the process, and that includes law enforcement, DCF, mental health, uh, medical health, our staff. Anyone who needs to be involved with this case can watch it as it's happening. Um, the beauty of this model is that it keeps the child from having to repeat their story over and over and over again. I was a school counselor for many years, uh, started in, in Tawanda, Circle District, uh, and then moved on to Andover. Uh, but while I, all the years I was a counselor, we dealt with many cases of child abuse, unfortunately. And, you know, it's horrific at best. And then these kids have to tell their stories over and over and over again. And, and you know, in the principal's office, in the police station, wherever it might be. They come to us, it's very child friendly, they tell their story one time. And so when I heard about the model, I was sold. And since we have opened in uh, 2007, we have completed more than 1,200 interviews. Um, I had uh, included a, a, a handout for you folks, and one side it talks about the CAC, which is what we call the Child Advocacy Center, and the other side is the Children's Home. But you can see, um, 
what our numbers have been. And quarterly, we send uh, out to law enforcement and the city council our numbers by city. And um, you'll notice that El Dorado's numbers are pretty high, and the main, there, there are many reasons for it. I'm not going to say what the main reason is, but a big reason is location. We're right here, and the uh, law enforcement um, people have been incredible. Uh, they use us, and we hopefully we are providing them with a good service. We don't have any legal jurisdiction. No one has to use us. Um, we just are the facilitators, so we are thrilled to be able to do that. And uh, I mentioned we have 10 standards that we have to follow. We have to go through accreditation, um, and we just actually every five years we have to go through reaccreditation. And just this uh, last year, we um, found out that we had passed that. So we are very thrilled and very proud of the gals that work there. Um, they deal with a lot of difficult stuff. And so um, I, I'm just very fortunate to have people like that running the facility. Uh, our second program is Sunshine Children's Home, and that opened in October of 2014. And um, we had anticipated we projected 100 children in our first year. Uh, we were using the numbers uh, from, well, I need to back up. Our basic service area includes Butler, Elk, and Greenwood counties, the 13th Judicial District. So we were using numbers from those counties of the children that were sent to Wichita Children's Home because that's where our children went before we opened. As of our absolutely on the exact anniversary day, uh, one year anniversary, we served our 400th child. Um, the reasons being, um, one is there's a lot of child abuse and neglect that goes on in the state of Kansas. Uh, another reason is there are very, very few facilities of our kind in the state. Um, our basic service is for temporary emergency shelter. Uh, when law enforcement determines it's not safe for a child to stay in their home, they have 72 business hours to find a more permanent placement, a, a permanent temporary placement, if that makes sense, a more long-term placement. So in that interim, they are trying to find a, a placement for this child that is safe and secure. Um, and so there are very few facilities of our kind in the state. We, I just got our latest report, we have received children from 49 different counties in the state. Children, they bring children to us two and three hours away. Um, the, another very important reason I think that they come to Sunshine Children's Home, and I'm going to brag because I'm not there and I, I don't do the nitty gritty uh, hands on work, our staff is incredible. Um, the majority of the children, I would say, come to us at night and through the middle of the night, and we have staff there 24 7 and they welcome these children and they take care of them. And so we're very, very fortunate. Uh, you can see our numbers as of today, uh, as of the end of February, we have uh, served our 558 child. So um, it ebbs and flows. We never know how one day out we'll have zero children there and today we had 13. So you just never know. Um, just very briefly, I'll wrap up our funding. Uh, we, there are no fees for service for the Child Advocacy Center. We are almost totally grant driven, uh, and that would be state grants, which sometimes is kind of a shaky place to be, but we've been okay so far. Uh, we also uh, get generous grants from United Way of the Plains and United Way of El Dorado, and several of the cities in Butler County support us. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the city of El Dorado. You have been with us since before we even opened. And those funds are critical. Uh, and all of the funds that we get from the cities go towards our facility here in El Dorado. They go towards our rent and our utility. utility. So we're very grateful for that. Um, the Children's Home does get a daily stipend from the state for each child. Each day they're there, it is nowhere near enough to cover our expenses, but it's a great help. So as you can see, we have a little gap, and so we're always looking for ways to um, make new friends. And, and when, we, when we built the Children's Home, we did a, a capital campaign and made a lot of new friends. And uh, just people very, very supportive of what we do. 
Um, I think those are the most important things for me to um, point out. I would love to have you come to the children's home for a, a tour as well. It will take you more than five minutes. Um, it's an 11,400 square foot building. We have eight bedrooms. We can uh, sleep uh, 15. And so some of the rooms have two beds and some have one. So we'd love to have you come over there and look at it. And just to wrap up, I want to say thank you again. You folks have been incredible, and your funds are critical. Thanks for the opportunity. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Oh, I love questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say uh, uh, thank you for the Yeoman's work and in in, in working in that arena, which is unfortunately we need to have that. But that's thanks to you and everything, everybody there at the organization. Doing thank doing you. That work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily Connell, director of Main Street. We have a packet here, I guess. You have a packet. You have a heap. You have, have a haystack. Um, and one of the reasons we have all that supporting material is because I'd like to make this report relatively quick. Um, there is a lot. Um, a lot that's happened in 2015 at Main Street and in downtown El Dorado, and I just want to thank you for your support for last year and look forward to continued support this year. We'll talk about that in the budget cycle, I'm sure. Um, but um, if you would just take a look at your annual report, it's in one of the binders. Um, it's really an activity report of all of the kinds of things that Main Street has been engaged in this year. It's been a big year of transition for us. We have a new board president, a new vice president on our board. We have a new treasurer. Um, we have a new offices. We've moved from uh, 145 North Main to 116 West Pine. We, um, we've just um, been working at refreshing our program, a recommitment to the methodology of Main Street and the uh, way that it has served this uh, community in the past and how we want to go forward. We are looking forward to the fact that the state has reinstituted not the state of Kansas, but the state organization of Main Street has reinstituted itself with a large grant through the USDA uh, for three years of funding and have just selected a new state executive director and will be re-coordinating uh, all of the Main Street programs that have um, kept going in spite of the fact that the state um, removed funding a, a number of years ago. So that's all very hopeful in terms of, I mentioned the word refresh, that is bringing the whole methodology of Main Street um, to a more, um, I don't want to say more modern, but it's the same basic four pillared approach. There's organization, promotion, economic vitalization, and design. And those are the four major committees. We have two committees that are underneath that. One is Frontier Western, which is, as, as you all know, a major event in the city. And we're looking at a, um, a 10th anniversary event this year. We have very able co-chairmen in the, in the persons of uh, Jean Plummer and Linda Baines, who are in charge of that for Main Street this year. And we have, uh, we're reinstituting the Artscape Committee. So it fits underneath. Right now, you'll see those activities uh, listed. And I won't be going through all of this <clears throat> listed. That's why you have it. But um, we also have a new promotions chairman, uh, Jennifer Wilson, who has been just terrific in refreshing, <laughs> um, changing the Christmas holiday. I don't know if you all were downtown for Christmas, old-fashioned Christmas. We collaborated this year with the county and with the Kansas Oil Museum. You all may know that typically the old-fashioned oil museum Christmas 
has around 100, if they're lucky, people on that night and this year with the collaboration in Candy Cane Lane, connecting the courthouse across Main Street and going down Central, they had over 800. And so we're looking forward to that the theme for Christmas will always be now old fashioned Christmas. We don't need to change that theme. And it's, um, in, in any case, we'll build on that. And Jennifer has been incredibly enthusiastic. We're looking for a chair for that particular event to work under um, Jennifer. This year we have a new chair for a trip or treat with Main Street. We had uh, the expected over 2,000 people coming to Main Street. We reoriented the event at Gordy Park. We've been working with our retailers downtown and with Public Works uh, to it was just too congested around Gordy Park only, so we'll re-include some blocks of Main Street and have Gordy Park there so the whole community, the businesses that want to participate that are not on Main Street can bring their trick-or-treat events down to the park. They have to apply, they uh, have to be identified, and, uh, and it, we got a lot of support from West Central businesses, for example. And I think that's going to be expanded and um, more, more fun um, this coming year. Um, we instituted two downtown cleanups, sort of when you don't know exactly what you want to do as a new director, it was like, well, let's just clean up. <laughs> we can start with that. And with the help, again, of Public Works, and we've had a <coughs> tremendous relationship with Public Works. We, we haven't been easy for them, and they have helped us every step of the way tried to keep us between the ditches, uh, keeping us in the realistic bounds of, of uh, what's been customary and what improvements there might be and how we can work together with the kinds of things they think are important for downtown and the regulations and so forth that ha they have to enforce to keep us all safe and so forth. But um, so um, that's sort of it on the special events list of things. I think for me personally, I'm very, very interested in economic vitalization and that whole part of making our downtown a, a destination that is our primary goal as an organization to densify the downtown. We completed, the last time I was here, I gave a quick report on uh, with our board chair, Craig Yarian, our board president. Um, the results of the survey we did requested by our city manager on what kind of reception our retailers would have downtown on a streetscape we do. That positive feedback, which was 100% positive, let's take the next step and see what would be best for downtown, I think has fed into the question of um, it, it's not just doing something for streetscape, but it has to do with the necessity of a major plan for downtown, for the core, not just Main Street, not just the downtown district. And I know that city is, is working to see how that plan might be further. And we have been meeting with uh, engineering and planning um, to see what we can do to further that planning process. Um, there has been, since last summer, and we also made a report to you all this fall, I think a, um, a real growing spirit of collaboration between the Chamber, Inc., the CVB, and Main Street. We meet monthly at least. We have a lot in common, a lot to work on. I want to uh, just bring your attention to this. This magazine, we've been collaborating with the publishers of uh, the Butler uh, County Gazette. This is last year's Visitor's Guide. There will be some changes. Uh, we're looking at a change in the name um, from Visitor's Guide. It would be also Resident Resource and Visitor's Guide. We want to have a vehicle for information relative to a community organizations make great partners. This is the first draft, hot off the press today, um, of a centerfold piece, if not centerfold, at least a double fold piece that would appear in this 
which this magazine, the uh, 16 magazine gets published in April. And uh, so it's very well distributed. I'd like for you all to take a look at this. You've seen all of this material before, but what we want is to have the population, um, all of our friends and neighbors, be able to refer to this to see how what we do is for separate organizations and how we work together. So um, we're taking the next step with that. Included in this magazine, I love public-private partnerships. And they have a, a map uh, of downtown in this, of the city. Um, they also publish this map. And they will be defining our historic district and our downtown district so that everybody knows what those boundaries are and that it is, in fact, a destination to reinforce that the city map, which they are working with um, engineering to supply a map that is perhaps a little bit easier to orient with, um, than the current map. This is a very popular map. They can hardly print enough of them. Um, but we think it can be improved. and. Um, so, but definitely with a uh, graphic uh, depiction of downtown and directions and uh, so forth of the historic district. This is a, in your, in your packet, um, a brochure that the design committee has been working on and is almost ready to go. Graphically it is, this will be a walking tour that is supported by um, uh, technology, you'll be able to, that's the piece that's holding up the distribution of this. They're working on um, being able to go around town and have it be self-guided. Of course, as time goes by, we'd love to have a cadre of uh, trained docents who could give tours to people and clubs and small groups or large groups or individuals who are thinking about coming to town. Uh, um, for example, uh, our new uh, director at Susan B. Allen and his wife Shannon, uh, Jim and Shannon, are very eager to take this walk and, uh, and learn as much as they can, as quick as they can, about the historic buildings and stories downtown. So, um, in terms of the historic district, we felt that, um, that in the light of all of the activities that are happening downtown, and if you look in your your report, there is a listing some specific properties and business owners and so forth uh, for, for 15. Well, that has been increasing in the last uh, two months. Um, and we felt that there wasn't enough real information in the community about our historic district. And so the design committee put together these guidelines. And Kendra was at. Um, the forum that we held, the, the community forum, the first one, and um, the state came down and helped. It's, uh, it, uh, Dick Morris talked about how we got our historic district, and um, I, it, we just need to know more about the honor of being a nationally certified historic district, the responsibilities that it entails, and how do we work together to foster a culture of compliance and also maximize the advantages that are there in terms of grants and tax credits and so forth. So um, I would say those are highlights. Um, do you have any questions for me? There's one question I get asked all the time. Yes? The Elderado Historic District and Main Street Yes. There are two different organizations. Actually, they're not organi uh, the, uh, the historic district is not an organization. It is because it is, and we did, in terms of our year of transition, we did also change our boundaries to fully incorporate the historic district. So the Main Street district now jogs southward to fully encompass the whole historic district. The historic district is it isn't an organization, it is a designation that the city has uh, been given because we have a density of um, historically significant buildings in a small area. 
and uh, you can see those that they're listed in the and uh, so what we are trying to do is work with the city to sort of maybe run the traps a little bit so when people want to do things that we I mean we've had a historic district as Frank Patton tells me uh, that whole appreciation for the downtown, it just hasn't been designated nationally or through the state. I mean, everybody in, in El Dorado has understood that the downtown is a resource for our city and is the authentic center of our city. And so, um, but n now we have incentives for people to um, keep the character of the buildings and so forth. Um, we don't have we have guidelines. We don't have, we work with the city to, uh, to try to um, guide people to keep our downtown uh, consistent. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but- No, but uh, go ahead. I'm with, right the, here. with the hail storm that we had, it yes. devastated the downtown district. Yes. Who do they talk to about staying within the historic gui guidelines? Because there's a few of them that don't know who to talk to about this. Do they come to you? Well, that's or? that's why, Greg. Exactly. That's the perfect reason. That's why we put these guidelines out. That's why we invited the whole community, and we will keep working on having people. The city knows to send them to us, but when they come to us, we do sort of a, try to do a preliminary. Um, interview with what they want to do. I'm, I'm thinking right now of three different properties, that have, property owners that have come in the last week, um, actually subsequent to, the, to this forum. And, and I can tell them, and I'm not an expert. I, I'm learning, but I'm certainly not an expert. But, but uh, Jay Shivers is, and our city is, and they know what, you know, so, but I just want to kind of get through some of the preliminaries so that when they are ready to go to the city to get their real answers, then um, they have a context. Does there that was, make any there sense? There was just some concern when they had that luncheon down at the Civic Center. Yes. And I was walking downtown, and there was a lot of business that didn't even know about that, that luncheon that was going to go on. And I told them what was going to happen and well, stuff, and they said that they weren't invited to it. And <laughs> I thought, well, you're in a historic district. Why weren't you invited to this luncheon? Every, every um, property owner whose address that we could get, and we got them all, I think, yeah. uh, were mailed an invitation. We did have, we were hoping for 30, praying for 50, and there were 82 people there. How many come from downtown El Dorado from the historic district? Well, they yeah. asked how many, This one of our state representatives, our state historic representatives, asked how many people were stakeholders, either business owners or property owners. And I think it, it, there was a quick estimate in the show of hands. What would you say, those of you who were there, probably over 30% of the people were, were there downtown. raised their hands. But we do have work to do. I mean, this is just the beginning, but it's recognizing that we are uniquely positioned to do that. We're working on a database that um, includes all of the businesses downtown. You'd think that that would be an easy database to get. We can't get it from the city because of state regulations. Isn't that right, Herb? Yeah. And, um, and there are a number of different direct directories. If you want to just take one quick look, and then I, um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is this, this just this page just outlines um, economic impact measures for El Dorado Downtown District, including the National Historic District, and it's a development plan to really put together the metrics that will tell us something about what's really going on downtown, including who owns the businesses, how to reach them without going door to door. And I've done some of that. We've started to coalesce small groups all last year, almost every month, we had a group of, of, of primarily property owners um, looking at vacant properties. What are your goals for this building? What are, what is, what are the impediments for getting these buildings uh, fully occupied, their highest and best use, that kind of thing? Now we're starting to meet with um, core retailers, mainly at, as part of um, really a collaboration with the CVB. 
the CVB is doing a tremendous job uh, bringing people into town. And we want to ignite our main street in cooperation with those visitors. And how are we going to do that? So we've started a small circle with the idea that we would enlarge it and figure out how we really want to welcome all the people to the Shrine Bowl, all the people to all of the events that are coming to the stadium, out to the, the state park and downtown. And, and uh, I mean, we have a lot of work to do, Greg. Yeah. It's true. Um, it, it was just some things that were brought up, and, and I didn't want to bring them up at your banquet because it was a, it was a pretty good deal learning about the whole what was going on down there. I really appreciate that you came. And uh, but there was some concern from the people downtown that they weren't invited. Well, it was an, it was a community forum. We we had three different articles in the paper. We had advertisements. We passed out flyers. Yeah. I mean. Sometimes when you're really working hard, like people downtown do, you, it's hard, you, you really have to work hard to get right in front of them. Um, but that's our job. So uh, help us. <laughs> so Main Street is, what's Main Street encompassed? Does it go all the way down Central or? You if, just... if you look in your packet, right. uh, go ahead and, and take a look in it right now because that'll be a duplicate packet for you. We. Um, this one right our here. yeah, okay. our um, design chair and president Craig Yarian put in no less than three maps to make sure that people were clear on those boundaries in different ways. So um, because it's a little complicated, but that that helps. I think we hope we're looking to use some of the vacant windows downtown to do displays, so we could have a permanent map and a description of the historic district and so forth. Um, is, there, is there a way for some of these businesses outside of the historic district to benefit from the historic district? Can they get grants from the historic district and move it further into their, further down central? It depends upon whether or not they have historic de designation. We've been working um, with, I, I, I would not, in a public meeting, want to talk about specific build businesses, right. but I'm happy what, if you could, if you have the time, please come by. We can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, in terms of who's eligible, there is a house over in Emporia that was built in 1870 that would very much like to pursue historic designation. And so we're, we're looking at that, they're far away from the district. Can they, there do, are can buildings. they do an island around them? You don't have to do, you don't do an island, you do the specific property. We do have nationally designated properties that are not in the district, in the town, okay. in our town. We do. I was asked that question too. You're not in the district, are you? No, my building is not in the district, but it is a, it is a national historic site. And so he's yeah. eligible for the same type Grants and are not grants as much as tax abatement. Yeah, tax. It, it, it is. It does. It does get kind of confusing. <coughs> it um, does. Uh, a piece of property uh, that is, as I understand it, uh, that is designated as a state or a, or national historic site has the same advantages of any building that would be exists inside of that historic district. That's um, as the contributing building. It contributing has to building, be a, yeah, contributing which, building. Yeah, contributing yeah, building. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Because it's not any building, it's a contributing <clears throat> building, and there are some parameters for contributing building. And um, there, mm -hmm. go ahead. But there yeah. are buildings who have lost their contributing designation, but they can get financial help reestablishing their contributing <coughs> status if they want to go through the process um, of meeting the national guidelines for that kind of restoration. And again, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. There was mm -hmm. a lot of questions that people no, asked. No, no. I don't know how to answer some of them. Well, we were on the spot together then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you. Um, certainly was, was at that forum as well. It was well attended. Um, uh, any, anybody? Remind me of your address again. 116 West Pine. Okay. Anybody who has um, questions about whether or not they think their building or their property is inside the historic district or the main street and what, what kind of uh, 
opportunities that provides for them, I would encourage them to come down to 116 West Pine and talk to Emily uh, with the main store organization. There, there certainly are some uh, positive reasons for, for having that district and for having the main street. So thank you for thank you. <coughs> explaining that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again, Emily, um, for the Main Street. Next thing on our agenda now is public comments. Yes, sir. Uh, I was jumping ahead of ourselves. Anybody from the audience wish to address the commission? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and move on to uh, consent agenda. Um, everybody's had a chance to receive their consent, their consent agenda in minutes from the previous meetings. And the appropriations, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion for the consent agenda. I move that the consent agenda as presented be approved. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. I, I guess I'd like to add to the consent agenda, or to add to our agenda at this time. Um, uh, we had talked about the opportunity for an executive session for non-elected personnel. Is it something we can add to the agenda now, or is you that don't, you don't have to, it? You don't have to do it. Just when you get to the end, add it. Okay. It doesn't right. take any action. Okay. Well, then we'll we'll leave that. Uh, the move to second. Any further discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Next on our agenda. On our agenda is the distribution of liquor tax and court, and court fees. Mr. Mayor, Commission, annually the city distributes money to nonprofit organizations for the collection of liquor taxes and court fees. The liquor taxes are allocated for state statute and the court fees were a program started by the city commission in 2009. In 2015, the city received $74,199.58 in liquor tax revenue. Of that amount, $12,366.59 is to be allocated through the liquor tax program. Uh, the balance in the liquor tax fund as of December 31, 2015 was $7,457.48. You add that to the $12,366.59 and you have a total of $19,824.07 to allocate this <coughs> Uh, the court fee program collected $5,359 in 2015. The balance in that account as of December 31st was $1,678.50. Add that to the 5359 and you have a total of $7,3750 to allocate for 2016. Uh, this evening we've re received requests for liquor tax monies from SCARF for $2,500 and Family Life Center for 9000 The court fee monies, we've received a request from SCARF for $1,500, Family Life Center for 2000 and the Elks Lodge for 2000 We have representatives here this evening from SCARF, Family Life Center, and the Elks, if you have questions. Um, I guess the question I have as I read through this, this the, uh, the liquor tax program, it looks like, am I right that there's a 19824 plus the seven, which is liquor tax allocation the, total? The total available for allocation in 2016 is the 19824 yeah, And then for court fees, it's 7037 So mm -hmm. combined, th those two numbers combined, except we can't, we don't necessarily, we can't combine them, we just have to allocate individually, right? But Correct. We're just doing that in the same order of business, is that? Yes, yes. We're just doing it all as one item this evening, but they, they have to be allocated separately. <coughs> and we received requests from those groups, um, and those were in your packet this evening. So um, if 
those are if they have you have questions they're here to answer those but and may or may be a little more background on these two programs yeah the liquor tax program is um was created by state statute and how that revenue is spent is defined in state statute yeah. butler county had the law changed i can't remember when so we're the only county that distributes it the way el Dorado does and then the court fee program was um in 2009 I asked the commission to consider, we were looking at court fee increases, and I asked the, the commission to raise it, if I remember right, a dollar and a half a ticket. Um, the liquor tax says it can only be used for drug intervention, I think. Tab, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the liquor tax is for um, children who are victims of yeah. okay. abuse. <coughs> well, that restricted some of these agencies that needed help so the uh, commission ended up saying yeah we want to do more than that and so it opened it up to really uh, civic organizations that met your guidelines and so the court fee program is a hundred percent at the discretion of the commission you've created it you defined it it could be subject to your changes the liquor tax is a state statute Okay. And as I read this for the allocations, we've got eleven thousand five hundred for the liquor tax, mm -hmm. uh, uh, scarf at twenty five hundred, and family life center at nine thousand. Correct. And then we have a uh, for the. Uh, Court fees, Scarf at 1500, Family Life Center at 2000, and Elks Lodge 1407 at 2000 mm -hmm. for a total of 5500. 5, that 11, back up to the, to the uh, uh, liquor tax at 11.5 and a potential allocation of 19.8 leaves us that, what, $8,000? You have 8000 left in the. And left in there, just and, and, in and the what fund. what what happens? What what's the what happens with that? What it stays in there. Yeah, there. These are both allocated in this manner, and so you've only allocated eleven. So your beginning balance next year will be the remainder, the nineteen thousand okay. minus the eleven, and so, okay. and then plus all the collections from twenty. Okay. So if people quit drinking, we'll still have some money. <laughs> well, you'll have a month. Well, they're probably two months behind, so you'll have four months worth. So th this doesn't mean we're going to give you eight thousand three hundred twenty-four dollars and seventy cents to spend on special park and recreation fund. No, the special parks and recreation fund. If you look at your agenda item, they received um, thirty-seven thousand ninety-nine seventy-eight, okay. and then you take off that twelve thousand, and there's they'll have the rest of that. Okay, that's what was confusing me. Okay, they already got their take out of that total mm -hmm. amount. Okay, and this, this is, is only allocated now, no other time during the year. Correct. And, it goes and into whatever our budget. Whatever's carried forward to next year mm -hmm. can be allocated next year. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a great program. Thank you too. Great organizations that just great that we're able to support them. Yeah. Yeah, and we back to the. I'm sorry to keep kind of. I just no want to make sure I have my numbers right. As I that 74.57 was what was left from last year. It, it's the it was the carryover from last year. We added the 12. And all right, I just want to make sure we. Yes, sir said that right okay um, any questions uh, from the, for the Commission for anybody who might be here from these organizations that would like to to share I don't think they're all noble causes okay thank you for coming those who are here thank very much appreciate it um, and it's I'd entertain a motion it's all you uh, I move to allocate the portion of the liquor tax monies in the Special Parks and Recreation Fund in the following manner and to authorize the City Manager to execute the appropriate documents and contracts with the following recipients 
and that these funds are, are dispersed consistent with Kansas statutes. Shall I read the three? You, you'll need to read the two people that received Oh, them. I'm sorry. Okay, SCARF, $2,500, Family Life Center, $9,000. Second. And okay. we'll read the other one and vote on both of them at the same time? Uh, no, go ahead and vote. We can and then we quit can and second. vote. Okay. Okay, it's been moved to second. Any further discussion on the, on the uh, liquor tax allocations? Being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. I move to allocate a portion of the court fees and the general fund in the following manner. Oaks Lodge, number 1407, $2,000. Family Life Center, $2,000. SCARF, $1,500. And to authorize the city manager to execute the appropriate documents and contracts with the following recipients, and that these funds are dispersed consistent with Kansas statutes. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for the uh, portion of the court fees and allocations. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, just so you all know, we'll be contacting you about contracts later this week, I believe. Brian's out of the office, but it, so we'll probably meet me. Okay. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. on our agenda would be the project paving of Griffith Street, central to Locust. Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, this um, project was brought to you last meeting of February 15th, and it was decided to be tabled due to discussion um, during the public hearing. Um, staff was directed to look at some different options to the paving of the road, um, and I'm here to present a few of those this evening. First, we're going to look at the original project as it was presented to you last meeting. Um, as you can see, it's a 31-foot road um, with a 41-foot wide widened turn lane from the Civic Center entrance north. Um, of course, the widened roadway there is, is the cost is um, borne by the city at large. Um, on there, we've included in these maps to kind of help help you look at what the different project costs would be are the cost per year to those properties within the improvement district. So where you see $2,038.24 on property three, um, that is what the city of El Dorado, since we own that property, would be liable for annually for 20 years for the improvement of Griffith Avenue. <coughs> Yes. Next, next, we looked at the option of a reduced project just paving the north 500 foot of Griffith Avenue. We heard this brought up at the last city commission meeting. Um, this street would then serve Century Plastics, Sunny Stop, and the city of El Dorado's properties, which are mark this three and four on the map. Um, total project cost for this is, project would be $345,000. Of that, the improvement district, benefit district, um, cost is $105,000, and the city at large is $239,000. In that city at large number, um, includes our property as well. We also looked at an option since the majority of the property on the project uh, was owned by the city of El Dorado. And since this would be a condensed project, we looked at the possibility of public works completing uh, <coughs> that stretch of roadway, uh, and doing a nine inch thick concrete pavement section. Um, still a cost for this project are 126,000. Um, that's material only, there was no labor in that. 
that if a district shared $50,900, city at large, $75,553. The fourth and final option we looked at, which is, is, is allowed by your street policy, is a three inch asphalt um, overlay <coughs> on the roadway. Um, we, we heard some of the property owners bring that up to you all. I feel, however, we, we would need to do some base work before we just spent the money and put some three inches of asphalt there. So to include it in those costs are um, some base stabilization work and three inches of asphalt. Now what differs from these other projects which have a um, bonding period of 20 years where their payments are due for 20 years, your policy states that an overlay work on a substandard street, um, the cost for that project is needs to be repaid within three years to the city. Um, and then any future work that's done on that road um, years down would be at their expense as well. For your policy today, if it's built to a city standard road, and uh, the city will maintain, its for, maintain it for its life. You adopt this one, you're going to open up a can of worms because everybody's going to want to do that on their own approved street. This has always been an option, and we've discussed it on numerous different projects, but when the owners see those costs, um, on, on there, you just look at the same lot, lot three that the city owns of $7,700 per year for three years. And then 10, 15 years down the road, more work needs to be done to the Griffith than that's piled on there again. Um, so some different options, uh, staff here tonight, I would like you to consider just Improving the whole roadway as originally presented, but um, I think that that will get the project done. Costs are only going to increase over the years. Let's stand for any questions you might have. That's the Correct. Yes. The numbers you have in yellow are per year. For how many years? 20, 20, 20 years. years. 20 years. For all but number four. Yeah, well, with number four, it's a three year. It's a three year. <clears throat> well, I'll say I'm, I'm leaning towards that recommendation and doing it as you guys originally proposed. I expected to hear or get some calls and have some conversations that I didn't hear from anybody. And so I think it's kind of something that needs to be done. What do we do now? Or kick the can a little bit. It's just a decision we gotta make. I had some calls. Lot seven, who's is that? City. City of Elberator. And six is Century? Century Plastics, yes. So really the only landowners that's not the city or Sunny or Century is eight, nine, ten on the left, right? Number two is Butler REC, um, right there. Number eight is uh, the Mulvaney's who were at the public hearing. And lot number 11, is, um, and I can't recall his name off the top of my head. Stowers? But yeah, the trailer park owner. Okay. Um, the city, the city owns lots nine, um, properties nine and 10 there below. Nick, was there anything from your conversations with people that gave you any new insight since last time we met? No, no, not new, just, Concerned it was going to cause a financial hardship on them. Yeah. Which it sure seems like a lot of most of the stuff we talk about up here, it always comes down to money. Yeah. Yeah, but 
That's Tell right. me again why you don't like option two. Well, I, I think it's, it's a good viable option and it serves the, the need today for the businesses that most likely use it, with us being the Civic Center and Sunny Stop and Century Plastics. The, we need to go ahead and get the rest of the road fixed just because ongoing maintenance costs increase. Um, you may see future development, redevelopment down in that area. And while we're going to the expense of mobilizing a contractor and bidding this out, I think it's in the best interest of the improvement district in the city at large to go ahead and just complete the entire project. Option one is our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. We don't want to change that. So option three, that's that's the same as option two, only that's with doing it in-house. Yes, sir. That that is similar to what we did on Cave Springs and Atchison. Um, another project we did with the improvement district was the alley from Walnut River Brewery. Public Works would be able to get in there and do that work, and only material cost would be charged of whatever your, you all's desire, of course. But as it's presented to you tonight, it's just materials only. Were we ever able to come up with a? And this may not be a fair question. If it's not, don't hesitate to tell me. Uh, did we ever come up with what the approximate mobilization cost would be on an outside contractor? You, you know, I did, I did some um, phone calls and, well, if you look at the difference between 345000 compared to 126, um, the project with us bidding out the 500-foot stretch is 345000 The project with the city public works guys doing the work is 126000 I uh, did some phone calls and, and tried to get some pricing on materials. And um, honestly, the, the size of the project, the, the length of it didn't have too much to do with the unit cost. Um, the reduced 500 foot stretch unit cost did go up, but um, with the larger project as a whole, you see the administrative items cost a little bit more. So the first one, is that all concrete? That would be, um, it's, it, it could be bidded either way. The, the numbers you see there are for asphalt. But it definitely could be bid either way. So if we approve this, will this move pretty quick? Because right now the rigs are all in this area. They're getting ready to move out. And you're going to move your good, good bids when they start moving out of the area. Survey has been complete on the entire project. Conceptual design works pretty much done. Um, we did that a number of years ago when we had had um, first started having it in the CIP. So a lot of work's been done on it already. I do expect that lots of people have got their summers lined out already. And then I, I think you, yeah, you were at the meeting where our, a lot of Kansas road construction companies are in other states because Kansas <coughs> has shifted so much money out of KDOT. And that's what's going to happen. They're going to start leaving the area. And it's going to cost more. So. Um, I, I, so motion one is for the whole. Motion two is for us. Uh, the motion there in front of you is for, is for the, the project one. we discussed last, last meeting in option number one. Um, if, if you wanted to go with any other option, we would need to recreate the project, republicize, and go through the public hearing process again. Well, thinking back to the last meeting, uh, Mr. Mulvaney, I mean, $2,600 per year for the next 20 years is quite an adjustment. It's over 200 bucks for him on a vacant lot, and even for Mr. Stowers, at an additional thousand dollars a year for 20 years. I mean, 
mean, huh. is it appropriate? <coughs> do we have a, before you go there, uh -huh. do we have a floodplain map overlaid on this? Is any of these I, I do not. Um, I will tell you that uh, the Mulvaney's lot, it, it was shown on the floodplain. They did bring a survey to my office and show it to me. And their property is not in the floodplain. Just the ditch, isn't it? Just the ditch. Okay. So, um, the only other affected properties are um, property nine there in the cities. Mm -hmm. Century Plastics, I believe, has a little bit in the rear, but it yeah. doesn't affect their current building. So, one, one could imagine that an, in, an improved street also significantly improves the value of the land. Um, since it's not in a floodplain, it'd be a difficult dis discussion if they were in floodplain, but um, I think that's something that needs to be considered uh, as well, we talk about it. If you improve the street, would it take away that problem in the ditches for them? Um, it, it would be a while before FEMA would reevaluate and map the site. We probably wouldn't live to see it. The, if, if the ditches are in the floodplain, more than likely the, the new roadway would be continued to stay in that floodway and down at a low enough elevation so it wouldn't impact the floodway or floodplain. Floodplain. Okay. Thanks. If, if, you, if you approve this uh, motion one, it's still subject to the same 20 day petition out. And so you, even if you, all you've done is started that process, so you'd still have a month. Yeah, but would they need, but, but no, the, they could have petitioned out, but it'd give you time to think about it and hear and, and talk about it more. You could, you wouldn't have to decide. You, no, you can't decide. All you can do is start the clock. Yeah. yeah. I'm confused. <clears throat> no, you, I, you know how Oak is. You passed Oak last time. Mm -hmm. They have 20 days to pull a petition, get signatures to take it out. And, and so Topeka Street is another great example. There was no way that the people on Topeka Street could petition it out. The petition, the law was such a way that it could absolutely, the commission had the authority to have it built. This is the same thing. But that doesn't prevent you from listening and then stopping the project. And so... <clears throat> A decision today simply push, pushes, allows allows yes. staff to to continue with design, solicit bids, or whatever that process might be. Or actually, you would probably come to us before you even go out to bids to get permission to, to solicit. Well, we'll bids. have to report back. On, we'll report back yeah, in but, twenty days. But if days. we do that, then if we decide we're going to go a different way, then we're going to start all over yeah. again, no. right? No, yeah. no, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So enough. that to me, that I mean that kind of defeats the purpose. Like Greg was saying, we need to, if we're going to do something, we need to get it done. I'll be honest, I'm only, I would rather see us do option two or three. I don't know what the advantage is. I mean, and all, well, I mean, other, you know, if, that if we did it in-house, I mean, yeah, it's just material only, but, you know, I mean, that's not free. Brad's guys are going to be here working, they're going to be doing something whether they're doing this or if they don't do this, they're going to do something else. So that, I don't know if that really holds any water with me, but I, uh, it seems to me if we do two or three, the, the Sunny Stop, who was really kind of the driver on this, weren't they? I mean, it's it's already have come. No, I mean today, I mean, but okay. the but, commission's been telling us to do this for years. Okay, well, okay, so it was a coincidence, which yes. which I normally don't believe much in, but uh, in one century plastics more or less in favor of this project or not? Or did I hear that mistakenly? I, I haven't heard from I was kind of under the impression they were in favor of it. So, and if that's true, then to me, either option two or three kind of takes care of those two. But my only problem with you going that way well, is just me. Because you told the people on Oak Street that you petitioned it in. That's a little different. That, was a, that was a valid that petition, petition Greg. That was a valid petition that was carried. That's a different deal than this. And now you're telling these no. people that they 
they can it's petition a, for another road out. We know I that. think we need to approve the whole thing and let them work on it and not, get it out. My friend, you're not talking just apples like and apples. Just like you're telling the people of Oak Street. You're not talking apples and apples. Oak Street was a petition that was carried. This, there was no petition carried here. Right. We instigated this, right. not, not the landowners. The landowners instigated Oak Street. There's, that's a totally different... But this different is part of our comprehensive plan, okay. that we're going to have a comprehensive okay. plan. Well, that's around. a different argument. Yeah. yeah. Part, well, well, the fact that it's part of our comprehensive plan is a totally different argument than somebody carrying a ballot petition. And is it... I mean, it is part of the plan. And I'm not... I mean, I totally... I see where you're coming from, you know, and talking about the folks on 8 and 11. But do we, is it, is it appropriate, I don't know, to, to do option two and they know that we're eventually going to finish it? I mean, almost give them time to prepare. Is that even? Well, it'll be a couple of years before they get a bill anyway. Yeah. So, and yeah. maybe more than that if, that, if time is of the essence. And so, I guess uh, that's true. I realize where you're coming from, Nick, on this, but the people of Oak Street won't realize where you're coming from. They'll just see that you gave concessions for this area of town. You know, if they don't realize it, I'm sorry they don't, but it doesn't change the fact. And the way I look at it now, we need to approve the whole thing and then let them petition out. That's Except the they don't have a, a chance of that's what I was going to say. That's 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 that. That. But you can, I mean, if everyone came and that besides the city came and told you don't do it, you don't have to do it. In 20 days, you can evaluate, and that's exactly what the commission did on Topeka. They couldn't petition out, but there were property owners that came and saw the commission and said, we don't want it. And it was compelling. And so even though the commission had started the project, pulled the petition, the commission heard the, heard the residents and didn't build it. I think we've heard the residents. I mean, the ones that are for it were for it. The ones that are against it are against it. But I just. So now they'll have to petition out. They can't. <laughs> They can't petition out. I don't know that there's, there's, out. there's enough. Well, I'm not sure that there's enough property owners to. There's not to do but, that either. Yeah. But the, they can appeal to you, and you can. They can't yeah. petition out. They can change our minds. Right. right. Correct. Yeah. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. They can do that. If you don't change your mind, they can do they that. Can so they can say they they can change well, our minds. <clears throat> you know, the other thing about this this road and it being on our comprehensive plan uh, and, and in the CIP talking about it for, I know this road's been talked about for several years. Um, it also feeds right into our parks and rec long range plan. I mean, we're looking at the opportunity for significant enhancements to East Park. Um, this simply sets the stage for that too, I think. Um, so. Uh, yeah. Okay, any, uh, any further questions or discussion on the item? I would entertain a motion. What's the resolution number, Tabitha? 2818. Mr. Mayor, I move that the resolution resolution number 2818, a resolution determining the advisability of making a certain improvement of the city of El Dorado, making certain findings in respect to and authorizing providing uh, for making uh, improvements to an ordinance, such findings, such to pro <laughs> protest, street improvements, Griffith Street, Project 491. I'll second it. Wow. Okay. We move and second any further discussion. Okay. Um, what's the motion to here? That's only if you don't. Oh, it didn't do it. Right. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, the move and second. Again, for any further discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, same sign? Nay. Passes three to two. Next on our agenda is a comp plan amendment uh, for our Connect 2025. Uh, this has to do with our Parks and Rec plan, and the, uh, we adopted that plan or, um, at our last meeting. This is a, this is uh, moving it, adopting it, placing it in our uh, into our comp plan. This is something that the Planning Commission had a discussion on as well. But this was been in their November meeting. We they. Uh, at that time, uh, passed it, but asked that we send it out, send it back out on the road for more public comment, and that's what we've done. And we and then turned around and adopted this uh, at our last meeting. And uh, with that, it's time to move it into the comp plan. Any further description or discussion from the staff? No. Uh, the reason it's it's here, we reported to the planning commission at their last meeting after your February 15th meeting, and Kevin Wisher was able to attend, talk about the, the more outreach and, and, and meetings that he went to and discuss the Connect 2025 plan. And basically what this does is take your comprehensive plan, remove the parks and recrea recreation section out of that, and inserts the Connect 2025 plan. I see the Planning Commission voted five to four to recommend what was their concern? It was public input. That was a big concern back in November uh, when they first saw this item was the number of responses to the surveys. And then when it came to you all's attention too and you asked um, Parks and Rec staff to get out there on the road again and make more presentations, and they've done that. So. I've got some feedback from our meeting we had on Wednesday. and. Uh, Quite a bit of feedback, and about the uh, the pool on Topeka Street, uh, they felt that it needed to be moved back to uh, Allegiant because it's part kind of an economic package for the city to draw tourism to the city if it's set there in Allegiant property and not in North Main. They called me because I said we needed to put it on North Main, and. They all think it needs to be back there. The Frisbee golf needs to be there. The ball diamonds need to be there to enhance the football field that's there right now. We need to, to adopt the original plan and not do any deviance from it. Not change anything with it, go with the original plan. Uh, there, there's a member of the rec department that would like to us to have a meeting with them, with the commission, and work together to get this plan funded. The, and the, I'll just comment a little bit about the plan. The plan had lots of options, so if you adopt it, it's going to have all the options. The, at, at this point in time, yeah, all you're doing is adopting a plan that had lots of options. Right. The, as you and the rec move forward with implementation, then you're going to have to figure out where you're going to put stuff. And so um, I think that's that's great input. Right. It's something that needs to be done. And I think that, um, and kind of as we discussed um, uh, Wednesday, we're going to start developing cost for you. And, and so there, you're getting ready to have a discussion about um, possible funding. And we'll break down those um, options for you. Is, is there a way that they can get involved in that with the us? Rec, I mean, the rec committee? The rec committee? Absolutely. Because they want to be involved in that. I mean, you, you, it's, it's normal that, they're, that it's all vetted through them and then brought to you. It's just, to, no one has gone, everyone is waiting for these actions. We're, we're just taking a series of steps and... Um, and so the next step you started taking the other night by outlining what, hearing what they wanted first and foremost. Right. Um, and so you're still on that same path. And they're, get, it, it, they're not, their work isn't done in my mind. While you have the authority to, to make all those decisions, it would be, it would be odd 
it, it would be untraditional to the commission to do that. And then there was another thing that the member was asking on the Frisbee golf course, they wanted to be tournament ready. And so they were asked that the city hire somebody to, to do the engineer work on that. Mm -hmm. So it is tournament ready. So we could be like Emporia, bringing in 25,000 people a year and bringing money into the city. They said this whole plan, they worked on this whole plan and it's an economic development. And if we don't do some of the stuff in the plan, it's not gonna, it's not gonna develop the city. Well, it's, I guess that is um, subjective and because the, the plan has a tremendous number of features that are about El Dorado and El Dorado's people and our, our local people. Um, there, are, there are components. I think that the Frisbee golf in the plan is nine holes, isn't it? So, so that, that notion is not accurate. Um, now the sales tax committee has been talking about 18 holes and, and so you can have tournaments. And so I think that, again, they haven't made a recommendation yet, but it sounds to me like what you're gonna hear later is that they're recommending 18 holes and, and a tournament ready and, and designers. Um, we talked to, internally talked to a designer, I think in Lawrence a year or two ago. There's two really good designers around the United States and two of them are in Kansas. One's in Lawrence and one's in Emporia. Um, the, uh, in reading the minutes of the sales tax committee, they have thoughts on who that designer ought to be and they list a name. I don't know that person but it wouldn't surprise me if it's from Emporia. Um, and so, yeah, we all, I think everyone's on the same page on that. Okay. Well, um, I think in our, our work session too, uh, we certainly identified the ones that we thought we could maybe achieve, still staying with it, within the plan and moving forward with it. We also had the discussion of, in that work session, I think, um, of, the 18, moving from nine to 18 holes and what kind of extra property that might take and what other partnerships, whatever, whatever other partnerships might be available in that, in that stretch of ground there in the Legion uh, and working with the Legion, uh, there's, there's several partnerships there to, to be in that. So I, Greg, I think, I think we are hearing, hearing them in terms of the, certainly the 18 hole um, and, I, and I would welcome the opportunity to talk to them about Know, how this plan gets implemented. And, and they felt that the tennis courts need to go to PT. They need to stay on city ground so when parents go out to the go golf, their kids could go play tennis. Okay. And there was, there was quite a, the impact from what was written caused my phone to read because my name was mentioned to put it on North Main and that's why I got targeted. But and that's why I'm talking about it, is they don't feel like it will move forward if it's on North Main, the aquatic park. If we put it down there on the Legion property with the rest of the stuff, it'll move forward. And that's what they want. That's what this person wants. Okay. And He said if we adopted in the comprehensive plan that he would like to see it kept intact and not split up, but you said we're not going to do that. Well, no. I, that, what I'm saying is that for the pool, there's options. There's, it shows it in different places. You get a, you have ball fields in, in locations other than just at the Legion. They have the pool in other places than just the Legion. They also show it staying in Forest Park. <coughs> And so you're going to adopt the plan as it was presented. Then the next step is start talking about, well, you did it. You kind of talked about priorities. Mm -hmm. So you, staff is going to get you the price tag on that and tell you how to, how to fund it, your funding options. Um, but the, 
the design work for the major components will not be something that can be done immediately. It's going to have to be thoughtful and take time. And um, but the I mean that we had the two lists. One was the bigger ticket items, and then the other things were quick things that staff can do ourselves and that we can probably fund within budget limits that we currently have. And so the the 18 hole disc golf. I, I mean, I heard the commission say move on that. And so we're just we're we're moving and. Um, I, I do suspect, I, I, I want to hear the, I want to have the sales tax committee make a recommendation and so we can start really planning, but because um, once they do, I, from what I've heard, it's going to come with recommendations on golf and then we'll, then you will have a recommendation that staff can act on. And so I think that when that happens, disc golf will be ready to go. Um, but like the pool, the pool discussion well, still. When you say intact, what do you mean by intact? Not say, okay, let's put the, the aquatic park on North Main in that pool area where it's at right now because that neighborhood is undesirable and people will not go to that neighborhood. Where if we leave it in the Legion, it is a desirable area. It's opened up to commercial. Everybody will see it. It will be with the rest okay, of the Okay, but basically what we're doing tonight is approving it for the comprehensive plan and the parks plan is just ideas right. and we don't have right. to follow it to the letter. Right. Correct. Just okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood what you meant by but the it, it was The way it was presented to me was members of the uh, park board feel like this is their baby and they want to go with it as it moves through mm -hmm. and they want to be a, just as much a part of it as the commission. They know we're going to have the final say so on everything but they want to be a big part of this. Well, I don't think anyone's I don't see that. that as a problem whatsoever. And so and that's why I'm talking about it because I got a lot of phone calls on it. They should be. And I'm sure we'll let them. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It would be it, it would not be normal for this, for the city of El Dorado to, for you to take this over at this yeah. point in time. I think you're, you're not disastrous. I think that was kind of perceived from our Wednesday yeah. meeting, and, and, yeah. and that's why I got the phone yep. calls. Yep. So that's why. 12 13. You ready, Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move that the recommendation of the Planning Commission to approve the City of El Dorado 2030 Comprehensive Plan Amendment replacing Section 7 Parks and Recreation with Connect 2025 Plan be accepted and that Ordinance, ordinance Number G1213 be approved. Second. Case moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I would take this opportunity to say thanks to the Parks and Rec Commission for all their efforts. They certainly spent a lot of time doing this. It's There are a lot of good things in that plan that I think in the long range are going to make a difference in our community. So I would say thank you to them for that. And and also reiterate that as we as we proceed, and we, we've done uh, our last Wednesday meeting was kind of a quick hit list on what we could do to make a difference in, uh, for the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak. Um, certainly don't want to imply that we would not have them involved as this project, as this plan moves forward. So I would welcome them to contact us. And, and I would add that just because we're adopting it officially and putting it in here doesn't mean that we don't welcome continued feedback from the community. Right. I mean, you know, we have had concerns about limited response with the initial survey, but we'll keep welcoming, you know, feedback about it because it is options and su suggestions and we'll, you know, weed through that to decide what's yeah. best for the community. And it, yeah. it, in all probability, it will take an election of some kind yeah. to fund it. And so, um, okay. you will absolutely get feedback when you ask people <laughs> to vote. Okay. Okay. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Wilkinson? Yes. Mayor Haynes? Yes. 
Commissioner Locke? Yes. Commissioner Excuse Lewis? Me. Yes. Commissioner Badway? Yes. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is uh, advisory board policy revisions. This is something we talked about at our last Wednesday meeting also. Kind of making some clarifications for policy and, and such for our, our advisory boards. Any further <coughs> clarification from the staff? Mr. Mayor, Commission, um, the current policy was last updated in January of 2008. As we discussed at your work session on the 17th of February, we have revised it to reflect information on the Kansas Open Meetings Act. Um, there are, is now a statement in there saying that employees cannot serve on advisory boards. Um, applicants must be in good financial standing with the City of El Dorado to serve on an advisory board. Applications are due 30 days prior to the appointment. And then we made some changes to the contact information, giving people the opportunity to choose the best way to contact them if they wish to serve on the board. And that was about it. Didn't we also have something in there about training? Um, we will be using this as a tool to train okay. the advisory board uh, members once <coughs> you approve it. And then after the advisory boards are approved, oh, sorry, reappointed and appointed in May and June. Okay. So. Thank you. We also have a request on motion number two to direct the advisory boards and committees to review, revise, and submit um, any changes they might have to their bylaws by July 1st of this year um, so that you can re review them and approve those as well. Okay. Is that two motions and one vote, or do you want two votes? Two votes, please. <coughs> okay. Any uh, questions from the commission? Are you ready? I'm ready. We need to entertain a motion. I move to approve updates to the standard procedures for city advisory boards and committees as presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. <coughs> any further discussion? Did you have any questions or moved a second? Any further discussion? Is this for the this is for yeah. the uh, no, I don't have standard procedures? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. I move to direct advisory boards and committees to review, revise, and submit their respective bylaws for approval by city commission no later than July first, twenty sixteen. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for motion two for the bylaws. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, we are at new business on our agenda. Anything from the commission? I would like to ask Mr. Meyer a question. Me too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can make one too. Great, thanks. Evening. Good evening, Ms. Wilkinson. Street lights in the business park. Okay. There's six of them now. There's solar LEDs. There is plenty of room for some more. What more can I tell you? We need more. Um, we're demoing right now. Well, not actually demo. We actually own uh, four right now. Some that are going to be at the airport because of placement. It's hard to get electricity to them. Uh, one of them right now that we're trying and so far very happy with um, is out behind the public works building in between the senior center parking lot and where our fuel tanks and, and fuel dispensers are for the city. So on the, on the north end of the senior center parking lot, um, there's one out there. Um, it comes at what I would consider a reasonable cost for the amount of light that you get. Uh, it mounts to, I won't say any pole, but lots of different styles of poles, whether they're wood poles, metal poles, whatever they may be. So um, there are some, some options out there and we're actually trying one out. And, Pretty happy with it right now. So there is a thought process going on. There is when you when you look at 
Westar's doing a projects all over the city right now. Um, some we know about, some we don't. Um, where all of a sudden a, a Cobra headlight with a high pressure sodium or a metal halide light bulb goes away and a new LED comes in. A new LED Cobra head comes in. Um, <clears throat> they work well. They are on the grid though. What we would be looking for in areas like the business park would be something that was off the grid. When we put the original ones up, the reason we went with solar was because of the cost to bury the electricity underground to um, put more in. So that was the thought process behind that. I think there's a lot of them out there on the market, so that's why we've gone to a couple different light lighting manufacturers so that we can understand the photometrics of the lights themselves, how they throw the light, what color the light is. Um, there's lots of thought that goes in it. Most of our downtown lighting has been converted to LEDs uh, as well, so it gives you a much crisper, cleaner um, light. So. so you're saying that, yes, you are looking at adding lights to the business park? We are looking at solar LEDs for lots of different projects. If that's one that you would like us to look at, we sure can. And, and how, the, how we got the lights that are there, the commission instructed us to put them up and we did. Um, and so, if you want to double the lights, you just make a motion and we'll get on it. Um, I, I'd encourage you all to take a look, because I think we'll end up changing the style that's out there to one like we have just put up north of the shop. And after the meeting, if you drive home through there, around the back of the public workshop, take a look at it, it really has uh, a, a, puts out a lot of light, and this is um, a lot. It has more lumens than what you would have today with the high pressure sodium, Correct. but probably not as many as what Westar is putting up when they put up their LEDs. They're they're using a lot more power. They're putting out a lot more light with their LEDs and using more power. And in some cases, the photometrics on those lights that they're using isn't all that great. Um, a lot of it may be wasted light, um, where you overshoot the roadway, where their goal is to, to light the roadway, to light a specific area of the roadway, intersections, et cetera, et cetera. Some of those may, may go over that. They may shoot some behind. And, and so it, this, this light that we're demoing right now that we're trying out allows us to do a lot of those adjustments. And that one we have adjusted so that you get no light back behind the fixture, which it's not as important to have it back behind as it is to light the roadway and part of that parking lot. So, but so even we, that, we can, right? get, I mean, we can our, get back to you on that. Yes. Or you just tell us. I mean, it's. Well, I'll, I'll second Kendra on that. I mean, I think there's a need. I mean, it's it's dark. It's dark. Very dark. You just need one more. I just need. I need a motion. <laughs> if, you, if that's what the direction we want to give the city to install more lights. I make a motion to direct the city to look at adding more lights to the business park. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to add more lights to the business park. Any, any, uh, you need a number? More than two, less than 52. There you go. All right. I'm going to say we'll start by doubling what we have. Okay. It's a good start. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Five to zero. Yes, Mr. Badwood. I'm done. I'm done with it. Well, she got what she wanted, so. Would you talk just a little bit about this uh, spring cleanup that's coming up? I've yep. been asked about that a couple of times. Thank you, yeah. I think that's a really good program we have. It is, and, and oddly enough, we had we met with some folks today where I, I got to brag on our on our refuse department and on our sanitation guys about um, what the city of El Dorado provides for your fourteen dollars a month. Um, and as we're as we're talking about the yard waste compost site, a spring cleanup, a fall drop off, your trash picked up once a week in front of your house in a cart, your recycle picked up once a week in front of your house in a cart, all of the things that, that the sanitation department funds with that $14. Um, the spring cleanup is has been going on for a long, long time, um, since way before for me. Um, it's something that 
we say it's spring cleanup week, but lots of times it takes way longer than a week. Um, the guys want to call it spring cleanup month because by the time we get all the limbs picked up and get everything picked up, um, lots of times if, if people do it how they're supposed to do it and, and clean up, it's for basically for cleaning up your, pros, your properties, which is what it was originally intended to do. It wasn't so you could store up all your garbage bags in your backyard and then set them all out one day in the spring and we'd come by and pick them up. Um, it was intended to clean up properties, um, to allow folks that moved into a house and there was uh, something sitting out behind that they don't want or other things like that. Or people so, that have no means to do it. Don't or people that don't have the means to get stuff to the landfill. Um, and so we've, we've done it for many, many years. And, it seems to be a good project. Cool, cause some streets, it's like a contest. So you can drag the most yeah. back into the street. Yeah, we. Yeah, I think I've noticed some people are already putting stuff out. Not a fun contest for us. Um, nonetheless, um, it's it's one of those things that there's a lot of good that comes to the to the community, uh, and so although it's a lot of work, the guys spend long hard days picking up picking up stuff. There's a definite benefit to the community to be able to to. Uh, to have that now i will tell you over the course of the last few years our numbers of tonnage have gone down some and so that tells me that we're making headway in getting properties cleaned up and, and that so uh ton tonnage numbers for fall cleanup last year were down from the year before that spring cleanup numbers have have been trending down over the last five or six years so that's good not because we haven't been going around picking it up, but because people are, uh, are finally getting crazy. everything. <laughs> it's only probably taken 30 or 40 years. And when's that? What are the dates? It is April 11th April, April, Yeah, the week of the 11th. So, and, um, and, along the same lines, um, and I don't, it's just a thought waving through my head. I mean, is there any, any merit to parking roll-offs at any certain area strategically located? For somebody to dump their own stuff in for a period of time or is that just asking for a mess well it, it's it, conceptually it sounds good um until we get the refrigerators in there that we have to and do something with <laughs> and and, yeah. and other things so we would we would just say if you've got something like that it, it will come right by your house i mean we, we're going to be right in front of your neighbor's house we're going to be right in front of your house uh, picking stuff up so rather than again having to transport it anywhere in the fall that's what we ask them to do we set roll-offs at Public Works. We have staff work that weekend, okay. and then they can bring it down if they have something in the fall. Right. So That's fine. Uh, the other thing that I'll say uh, while I'm up here is our dump truck program begins April the 4th. Um, and so that's when you can call down and schedule a dump truck to come to your house overnight. It's Monday through Thursday, not Fridays. Um, and you can schedule it to come to your house and load it up for, I think it's 10 bucks or something. And, um, another program that. 15? What's that? I thought it was 15. 15. Is it? Yeah. Okay. That's still the hell 15. Of <laughs> that's still pretty cheap, yeah. Dump truck load of crap for 15 bucks. That's, man, that's a deal. So, yeah, so that starts the April 4th. So, what, they're both great programs, and I'm glad you guys are able to do it, and I commend you for doing it. I just want to tell you real quickly, the, there was an article in the paper, uh, not an article, but it was a snippet, I guess, um, that you know really makes me proud to be a, a city employee because the article wasn't signed, but and, and I can't quote it word for word. I will tell you that one of my employees came in my office and goes, did you read the paper? And instantly my head's like, and he goes, no, 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 it's not bad this time. It's not bad this time. And, and it, was, it was somebody just okay. saying, thank you for taking time to tell the tell employees that you see out doing things thank you um, i think that's important because uh, we get lots of phone calls about different things going on in the community and people don't understand what we're doing they don't understand why there's two cop cars behind me in a car stop or why the firemen do something like this or why on earth are you patching potholes with gravel and sand you know they, they don't understand and so um, when you when you take time to understand and call and ask the question, well, what are you guys doing? Why do you do it that way? It makes a lot of sense because, um, and I, so I thought that, that, that snippet in the Times, I don't remember what the, the heading it was under, but um, it just said stop and say thank you. And, and that, that makes everybody feel better. So anything else? Chase, you sure? 
<laughs> you wait till I get set down. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lewis, do you have anything? No, I don't. Commissioner Locke? I do not. I don't have anything, any new business tonight to speak of. Um, city Manager's report. Yes, sir. I need. I wanted to report on a couple things for you. Um, we found in our records um, a letter from the Corp of Engineers saying that our late debt is a hundred-year contract, um, and so the life of the project is still not set. Life of the project is as long as they want to operate the lake. Um, and so that's not set, but the debt is a hundred year debt. Um, we had put that in our websites, files that people may want to read. So it's now online. Thank you. Um, we also uh, found one of the amortization schedules. We haven't found the one that we talked about, but we found another one. Um, and it's online as well that talks about again, worked on the assumption that it's a 100-year debt and the amortization schedule is everything set for 2081. And that's cast iron underwater. Cast iron, well, it is the 100-year. It is the United States of America and it is a contract. And so, um, so I've okay. qualified it. Okay. But, I mean, it says the it's from the district Colonel, I think, in 1988, and says, "Here's the, here's what's going on, and here's when you got to have it paid off." And so that date is 2088, no, 2081. And so, even though I guess there are there are people that want it to be a 50-year contract, it isn't. Well, I mean, our contract with the Corps of Engineers is a hundred-year contract. And so it's a it's a wonderful little read. It's um, and so if anyone's interested, it's out there. So that at a boy, Dave. <laughs> there you go. Um, I also had and so um, two other things. One, the Jasons are here from Prairie Trails. You can ask them questions if you want, but I'll narrate. The uh, Prairie Trails Advisory had a question from a golfer who um, has a roommate. They are not married, but they are a couple and would like to have a couple's membership. Um, and so the, re the, they, the advisory heard that, recommend, heard that request and are recommending to you that a couple that's living together is, can have a couple's annual pass. And so if you have any interest in that, then we would make that so. Do we have to make a motion or anything? I'd love that. You would love that. Okay, let's see if I, well, I guess if you have any questions first. You could probably. I guess I got one, but I don't have the guts to ask it. So go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, is it is it where that if they are no longer under the household that it's void? That'd be I mean, my assumption. Just that they're not living together for the week. I think apply. it's uh, no. Okay. I think uh, from what I heard, I'm gleaning it was you'd call it common law. Yeah. Which yeah, but is, isn't there isn't there a set number of years of, of said couple for it to be common law? No, that's a large tale. I think it's one night you could yeah. actually make an okay. argument. Really? Really. How many times have you been married? Wait, we don't, <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go here, guys. <laughs> this is serious stuff, guys. Come yeah, on. yeah, okay. And, and, so, and I guess, how, if, if, there, if someone is interested in making a motion, if you would just accept the recommendation of the advisory, that would probably be enough. I move we accept the recommendation of the Prairie Trails Advisory Board. I'll second, second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? 
All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries five to zero. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, we've had a, a big change in um, recyclables. The falling of the price of a barrel of oil impacts plastics. They're the bulk of our recyclable goods. It also impacts paper and tin. So we used to get paid for our recyclables. Today they're we're giving them away. We are not far from paying to get rid of them. And so the world is changing and that is going to blow our budget up. Um, our thoughts today are that even when we pay to get rid of it, it will still be cheaper than it would be to landfill our materials. But and, and I think part of this, you, you all probably remember when a big port facility in China blew up and burned and killed a bunch of people last winter. That was where this stuff all went. It was a big recycling process in, in China. Brad's here and he can so on it if you'd probably like. semi-annually we visit with different brokers around. We're not... We've never in 20 years signed any contracts, no floor prices, um, no guarantees that we're going to take your material for X. Um, we've never done that, and quite frankly, nobody wants to do it now. Um, it is, it, there's a couple of things that are worth pointing out. Um, number one, it, it has nothing to do with us going to single stream. Um, the processing facilities that sorted the material, the municipal, city, the municipal processing facilities that sorted material out have all stopped that because of the, the value of what you're sorting out. Um, it, was way, it wasn't cost effective to have all those employees sorting material for what you got paid for it. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, going to single stream. Uh, the other thing that we hear consistently as we talk to vendors, um, ones we currently deal with, ones that we have dealt with, ones that we have tested the waters with, are El Dorado's material is very, very clean. Um, we, had a, we met with a, another broker today um, that said they won't even consider taking waste management or waste connections materials because of the cleanliness issue. Uh, it's a really dirty mix. Ours is a very clean mix. Our citizens do a great job of, of sorting out recyclables from trash. And that's all we ask that they do now is, is separate the two. Um, they always talk about how much do we have and how much do we see us taken in. We currently recycle about one third of our overall waste stream, which 33% of our waste stream being able to say we recycle that is phenomenal because the national average is nowhere near that. Um, it's down in the eight, nine percent range. Um, so ours being at 30 some percent is, is great. Um, so, so as you, as we think about this, as we look into other options, we got back a report from one today that we had checked out last week and the, the price that they wanted to be able to do it to haul it to Lawrence was insane in my mind. Um, they they very clearly said we don't want any more material because uh, we'll there there it was it was a gouge it wasn't even a reasonable figure to get back so um, our program is doing good the people are doing a great job of, of recycling it's just the the commodities markets are so down right now and it's cheaper for them to do new resin for plastic bottles than it is to do um, recycled resins so um, it's kind of a double-edged sword because we're doing really good, but you, we're running out of places to, to go. So it's, uh, it's frustrating because you tell everybody for so many years to continue to do this and we're doing it for the right reasons. We're saving landfill space and now uh, you're getting to the point where you would have to make that choice if you continue to do that or not. So we probably got 
on any in any given month between 70 and 80 percent participation in that program as well for a non-mandatory program again that's just a, a credit to the people living over here so we're going to continue to let other cities use our program too we're going to bring their stuff in or are we going to cut them off after a while or as far as other cities, the only program that we have that we've partnered with is the county, right. uh, at the county landfill level, and and that's certainly something that that we would we would think about. Well, you can do drop offs today. We don't ask where you live at drop off. Right, that's correct. So, I mean, I still think it's a good program, and I believe it. So we did, and and I think that that's been the history of the community for a long time and so we just wanted to get out in front of you and let you know that and the price of oil is going to go back up well and and now we had a, we were having staff was having a conversation today a little bit about how the economy is right now with gas prices being as low as they are people have more disposable income we've actually seen trash numbers going down and and recycling numbers following suit just as a as a whole and, and one of the ways that that gets explained is when you, when you have disposable income, you don't eat at home as much. And so when you think about eating at home, you're now going out to eat. Well, your waste stream, is a, it's a different waste stream when you go out to do that. And so when you think about that, you're, you're not at home spending as much money on stuff. You may take another vacation. You, may, you have that disposable income. <clears throat> and it's, they've seen it all over the United States. We've seen it really heavily over the last couple of years where trash rates will go down. Now our construction rates, uh, our construction dumpsters, et cetera, have gone up. Um, the amount of material in them has gone up. The amount of projects that we've done have gone up. So those numbers have, the waste numbers have gone up, but when you look at it as commercial, residential, and industrial waste, our residential numbers for trash have gone down. Everybody's like, well, hey, that's great. That's good. Not less less uh, trash going to landfill. It's also less recycling material coming in as well. And so there's there's a lot to that story. And, and when you tie the, the current economy and the, the low cost of fuel and the more disposable income, when you tie all that in together, people go, oh, I never thought about it like that. But that's absolutely how it works. So just wanted to let you guys know, keep you in the loop. Thank you. Thanks. And that's all I had, man. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's the end of our agenda. We had talked about uh, adding an item, which is the executive session for non-elected personnel. I think we'd like to try and keep that uh, if we can. Um, I need a motion and a time frame. How much time, commissioners, do you think we start would like to have? 30 minutes. Start with 30 minutes. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move we adjourn into executive session for the purpose of discussing non-elected personnel and to reconvene in the commission room at 9 p.m. Second. Let's move to second. Any further discussion? In favor say aye. 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 We are convened to executive session. Thank you. Thank you.